The most beautiful things in life are not things. They're people and places and memories and pictures. They're feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. This is the Wisdom Worth Knowing podcast. I'm your host, Craig Chamberlain. If it's your first time joining, welcome. Thanks for giving me a shot. The Wisdom Worth Knowing podcast is brought to you by Amazon Audible, where listening is the new reading. Get unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks completely free for 30 days. Sign up right now for a limited time offer for my listeners at audible.wisdomworthknowing.org. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot wisdomworthknowing.org. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on whatever network you may be listening on. It helps feed the algorithms. That's Facebook, YouTube, and Rumble. You can also like, share, or just leave reviews on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. The most beautiful things in life are not things. They're people and places and memories and pictures. They're feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. Why is this so difficult to remember? <laughs> you know, when when you have these things, it's really easy to take them for granted, you know, because we don't, depending on the season we are in our life, we don't always have these things. We don't always have people in our lives, places in our lives, memories and pictures that are positive ones. We don't always have good feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. Many of us don't. You know, many of us are in a season of, of extreme darkness. And nobody understands the significance of what this quote is trying to say more than the people who don't have them. This is, what's in, this is one of the things that is incredibly frustrating about being a human being. I mean, it, it is a serious point of irritation for me. That this gratitude thing is so incredibly elusive. Happiness and joy are so incredibly elusive. And it's pretty much all self-created, right? The Our inability to fully appreciate and value the things in our lives is almost 100% self-inflicted. Uh, another reason I think it is a point of frustration for me, it's because if I'm generally unhappy or sad, in most cases, it's because my my thinking about things is just wrong. And I'm allowing negative thinking or poor thinking habits to kind of sneak in and hijack the obvious blessings I have for that moment. And I'm focusing on all the wrong things. One of the most important aspects of this quote is that very first sentence where it says, the most beautiful things in life are not things. And we are a very materialistic culture. Although I think we've made some progress in this area as a culture, I don't think we value things as much as we used to. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just older and I'm seeing what I want to see. <laughs> but... I think people are starting to catch on to the reality that wealth and prosperity are only one tiny corner of what it means to create a meaningful life. You know, if you make that the singular central focus of your life, it becomes pretty empty pretty quick. Uh, I, I fell into this trap for a couple years and then I realized, you know, I always I always tell my kids more money, more problems. You know, there, there's a limit to the amount of happiness that wealth can bring you. There just is. It, I think what I like to say is it reaches a saturation point because you can always make more money. Like, you can always get another job. You can always spend more time advancing your career. You can always spend more time becoming a better version of whatever you are at work. And these are all noble pursuits. If that's that, If you're doing the job well because you want to become the best at the job, that's not things, right? But if you're becoming better at your job just so you can buy more things, this is where things become kind of shaky. You know, it's one thing that if being the best version 
of whatever career path you've chosen is a noble pursuit, right? I'm going to be the best plumber or the best physician or the best programmer or the best artist or the best movie maker. That, that, that in and of itself is a noble pursuit, I believe. Because I don't think that's things, right? That's not a pursuit of material wealth. That's a pursuit of, of advancing a profession, which is great not just for you, but for everybody involved, right? So you are setting an example. And I think that I believe that is a noble pursuit. You know, I think that's what I talk about in the show pretty often as being the best version of ourselves we can. That includes career wise, being the best version of ourselves. The trap here in the quote is that whether we are squeezing wealth out of the world so that we can go and buy more materialistic objects. And, and whether we make materialism the center of our focus, like a bigger house, a bigger car, a nicer car, a nicer living room, a better living room set. I mean, man, nicer clothes, nicer... I mean, heck, you go you can go crazy with this. Uh, you could go down the plastic surgery route. You could say, well, I'm going to fix my nose. I'm going to fix my face. I'm going to fix my body in some way. Like these, the materialistic aspect is where I think things become extremely dangerous in that pursuit. And it is a trap. You know, it's, it's, it's like any other trap. These things in and of themselves are not bad things. Cars are not bad things. Houses are not bad things. And if you've, you've done a tremendous job accumulating these things because you're well-disciplined and you've done a, you've, you've done your, contributed to your career in a positive way so that you can afford them, then I don't think there's any problem in owning them. The question is whether or not at the end of the day, they own you. Let's say that again. It's, there's no problem in owning nice things. The question is, is do the nice things own you? Are they master over you? The, the people of old, the religious people of old, I know how tacky and boring they may sound, but they had something that was called temperance. And temperance was the act of tempering your desires and passions into something useful. Temperance was built on the concept of, of a blacksmith who would tw- take a take metal and heat it up and rapidly cool it and beat it and then heat it cool it beat it and they would continually do this and they would hammer it into shape and until it would take shape of a tool or a weapon or whatever it might be but in other words it took it took form of something that had utility and it was useful in this extreme heating and cooling is a process that we can do to our to ourselves and our desires. We can temper them. If we don't learn to temper them and beat ourselves emotionally into alignment of something useful, then this extreme heat and this extreme cold can burn us or hurt us, you know what I mean, or freeze us. So if we don't temper ourselves and our desires for material wealth or our desires for, man, anything. Pretty much anything can become the master of us. If we don't learn how to temper the extremes of our personality, then we will always be subject to them. We will be subject to the extreme temptations of material wealth because there is going to be no shortage of people selling you something. There will be countless people who are going to tell you that you're not going to be happy until you have this house, this car, this shirt, this amount of followers on Facebook, this amount of of success. And we need to beat that out of ourselves. We need to know where we begin and the desires end. If we do not temper ourselves, we will be subject to constant indulgences and they'll come at a cost. And on the materialistic front, 
the indulgences will include racking up credit card debt. It'll include overextending ourselves financially. It'll include blowing all of our check on a weekend uh, of fun. On a, on a regular basis. I, I'm not saying you don't splurge from time to time and, and celebrate the fact that you're doing well financially. That That is, of course, important to celebrate. The... The lack of temperance is, is, is if every evening becomes a celebration, right? <laughs> every evening is, hey, I made money this week, so I'm going to blow all of it. You know, and you do that every day of your life or every week of your life forever, you know, and you never actually temper that, reel that in, you know. It's pretty easy to spot people who lack temperance. But before I go into that, Wisdom Worth Knowing is brought to you by Amazon Audible. If you're like me and you love reading but don't have the time, then Audible audiobooks may be the perfect solution for you. With Audible, listening is the new reading. You can pop in your earbuds and discover that next exciting adventure or expand your knowledge from any PC, Mac, Android, Alexa, or Apple device. And check this out. Because you listen to this show, my listeners for a limited time can get instant access to thousands of audiobooks, from Audible's Premium Plus catalog, completely free. Just visit audible.wisdomworthknowing.org right now and take advantage of a free 30-day trial. That's right, for 30 days, you'll get full access to Audible's Premium Plus catalog as well as an additional free title of your choosing. If you discover audiobooks aren't for you, no problem. You can cancel instantly online. That's it. It's that simple. Two years ago, audiobooks began to change my life, and they may change yours too. Pause this podcast and head over to Audible, that's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot wisdomworthknowing dot org, and sign up right now for this limited time offer for my listeners. You don't have to look really hard for people who lack temperance or lack the self-control and self-discipline necessary to really enjoy things in life, because I think temperance, temperance is absolutely essential we need to master the joys in our life in order to truly enjoy them otherwise when they when we become subject to their mercy and we become enslaved to them then they it sucks the any amount of happiness and joy we may have gotten out of them i'm going to cite a couple obvious examples here if we talk about wealth if materialism and wealth master us this looks like credit card debt overextending ourselves never having any spending money not having any savings account not having any tangible assets that we've accumulated over a decade when we are we are slaves to materialism all of the objects in our lives own us. And I don't mean this like, oh, I went and took out a mortgage. Like th these are, that's obviously a highly debatable thing. But and in some way you are a slave to that. But I am too. I, I did a mortgage thing too. But we, we are, the extreme cases of this in which we are enslaved to them is when they completely own us. Now, if you're in this situation, obviously you can start getting out of it by starting to pay off those things. The uh, scripture for that is the borrower, borrower is slave to the lender. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, relationally, all right, if we are if we're not temperate in our relationships, what does this look like? Well, it looks like serial daters, pornography addiction. Um, it looks like not being able to create any sustaining, lasting relationships. Cheating. Um, looking to others for our happiness. But you may not have heard that one before. If we, have, if we are enslaved to relationships... And we haven't tempered where relationships are supposed to be in our life because they aren't supposed to be the center of our life. 
despite what Hollywood may tell you. It's supposed to be a mutual friendship in which you both complement one another, not in which you cannot serve. Well, I shouldn't say cannot survive, but because that kind of depends on the level of intimacy you have. But it's when you are looking to the other person to make you whole, like in every way. That would be enslaved because then what this would look like is you constantly have expectations on them and you put pressure on them to be something that they're not, to fill that inner void. So that would be an example of a lack of temperance in our relationships. A lack of temperance for food is an obvious one. We gain weight. Um, I went through a season of this where I put on like 45 pounds. Obviously, I, did, I wasn't tempered in, in what I consumed. And now, for some reason, culturally, we assume like that's a good thing, you know, when we lack temperance. But there's a lot of negative health things, obviously, with, with being overweight. And that's actually my blood pressure went up. So it was one of the reasons I, I really had to wrestle with this with this weight loss thing, because when I was younger, I never had to deal with it because I had a high metabolism. But then as I got older, then it started to catch up to me. So I had, I had to actually wrestle with that for like two years. I had to reel that in and become temperate, but a lack of temperance in this area becomes obvious, right? We, we gain weight, we become more unhealthy. We, So this temperance thing is, is absolutely essential, you know, for us to, to be able to enjoy things well. And that's just a few examples. There's obviously every area of our lives we can take to extremes, the extreme hot and cold. And then we can decide whether we like jumping in the fire and jumping in the water and jumping in the fire. But hopefully eventually that gets old for you and you realize you have to rein that in and, and, and learn to master it so you can enjoy it properly. So the most beautiful things in life are not things. They're people and places and memories and pictures. And these are things that we can't really buy. No amount of money can really buy people. I mean, money can help you visit places. They can help you make memories. But generally speaking... The quality of those memories and places depends on how much freedom you have at that moment to enjoy it. And you're not indulging. But it's generally these memories that we've created with others or alone with God or in full appreciation of, of life that have the most beauty. They are feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. And these are incredibly elusive things and we can't manufacture them. They, they, they almost have to happen organically. And I think in my life where I really struggle with this is in trying to force these things to happen. But the best moments in my life were spontaneous And if we don't ever put ourselves in situations where spontaneity can occur, then we can't really create scenarios in which we have these beautiful moments. If we never leave the house, you know, and we sit in front of the TV all day, every day, they're not going to create a lot of opportunities for us to make memories that we can experience this kind of beauty. So we kind of have to start taking risks. We have to put ourselves in uncomfortable situations or seemingly uncomfortable situations or in different places that something spontaneous may happen. It does seem like in a culture now we have so much control over our environments and so much control over what we watch on TV, what we listen to. We have so much control that there's very little spontaneity and novelty in our lives. It's all like controlled spontaneity and novelty. 
And I feel like something's lost in that. Like when we've, now that we've got full control over those things in our life. When I was growing up, when we turned on the TV, we were at the mercy of whatever was on TV. That's just how it was. But it's indescribable how many things I discovered through that spontaneity. And, and I feel like in some ways television was more enjoyable back then. And I don't think it was just because I was younger. I think it was because there was more opera. As much as we complained that there was nothing on TV, finding something on TV was like awesome. It was a cool experience because you found something. You discovered something. And now we can replicate that by today's standards. We just need to put ourselves in a position where we're not in control. You know, we need to take risks and say, and not just judge a book by its cover. We, we need to just try something new on purpose. You know, force ourselves out of that routine so that we can create a situation in which spontaneity can occur. It's the same thing where we, where we put ourselves, if we, if we go to the same places every day and we do the same things every day as part of our routine, routines are incredibly beneficial and helpful for our growth and development, but they can be incredibly stifling. So maybe we need to go for a walk somewhere else, or maybe we need to go have dinner at a place we don't usually eat, or maybe we need to hang out with people we don't usually hang out with just to see what might happen so that we can create these new memories that of unexpected things that may have happened sure it could go the opposite direction it could totally suck <laughs> it could go really poorly but it's different it's new and there's a chance things could surprise you So I do think that life is is kind of a, a weird balance between meeting our expectations and consistency, but then also making sure that we have a nice, healthy degree of novelty. So that we can, con it, it kind of reminds me of the C.S. Lewis quote, you know, where, you know, art does not have value, life value, but it gives value to life. Art being something spontaneous and exciting because art is something that kind of is reflective of its novelty, right? Art is something that stands out and is unique. But if we don't stop to create these unique moments, we, are, we don't bring our family on vacations or we don't go out with our friends every once in a while or we don't experience something unique and novel, then it's going to be hard to remember why we even live our lives to begin with. And so I think that this, this making sure we place ourselves in an environment of novelty is, is an essential component of living happier lives. I, I think it's absolutely essential. Because those, are, those tend to be the most beautiful things, those memories that we create that are, are unique. And so we at least need to put ourselves in a position where we can do that from time to time. It's very easy to get rigid, you know, when you get older and you get a career and you get a family. It's very easy to get rigid and it's almost becomes a survival thing, right? Like you, you make sure that your life is incredibly disciplined so that you can function effectively. But, but if, if we take that to too much of an extreme, then we've eliminated any novelty in our life or any opportunity to create these feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. Because laughter, a big part of laughter is, is the unexpected, you know? And if we're only surrounding ourselves with people and places and things and locations that are predictable and expected, then it doesn't really create an opportunity for the unexpected to happen. And so it really kind of makes it difficult to experience genuine spontaneity. I need to get better at this. You know, now that I'm thinking about it. It does help that I'm coming out of winter because winter, when we, we, 
that we came out of winter because when winter time is particularly difficult to do this because you're generally trapped indoors a lot so there's less opportunity for spontaneity and there's just generally less things to do out of the house and so as spring and summer kind of take root it it is easier to put yourself in in situations and places that are, are that have more of a novelty to them or more of an opportunity for random things to happen and so and sometimes we just go through seasons of immense discipline and if that's the case then we should plan a one week or a two week vacation to escape it you know be disciplined for however stretch of time is necessary to get through whatever project or work or whatever career thing you're doing at the time and then schedule moments of spontaneity and excitement and and change even if we don't want to force ourselves into those environments because we do need something to remind us of why we do all this to begin with <laughs> We're supposed to be doing this not just for ourselves, but we do it for the people and the places and the memories and the pictures. And we do it for the, the moments and the smiles and the laughter. And we do it to create those memories for our kids so that they can enjoy their lives. But if they don't, here's something that's been really sobering for me is that if my kids don't see me enjoying my life, how do I expect them to enjoy theirs? This is something that's been really challenging for me this year in particular is that you can get all wrapped up in this discipline and being an effective person and being the best version of yourself that you can be, but if you don't actually enjoy life, you're teaching people that too. That's spilling over into their lives. And so I'm trying to make a better effort into enjoying life around my kids in particular because I'm teaching them whether or not life is something we should enjoy. It's not supposed to be all work. So yeah, the most beautiful things in life are not things. They're people and places and memories and pictures. They're feelings and moments and smiles and laughter. This is the Wisdom Worth Knowing podcast. I'm your host, Craig Chamberlain. Thank you for joining me today. Whatever network you may be watching on, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, or Rumble, please like, share, and subscribe. That helps feed the algorithms to help the show grow and help people find us. You can also subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And don't forget to leave a review if you like the show. Check us out at wisdomworthknowing.org. You can connect to the show there in many different ways. You can also donate if you'd like to help the show grow. We are brought to you by Audible, where listening is the new reading. Get unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks completely free for 30 days. Sign up right now for a limited time offer for my listeners at audible.wisdomworthknowing.org. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot wisdomworthknowing.org. Until tomorrow, let's work on being the best version of ourselves we can today because that's all we can do. Have a great day.